praise team. Thank you, David, for your leadership in this wonderful ministry. Thank you, Greg, for wearing a green and orange plaid shirt today. It's like we planned it. If you have your Bibles today, and I hope you do, take those out. I'll meet you in Romans chapter 14. Uh, Next week, we're going to land the plane as we have journeyed through this book of Romans. And we will finish up uh, next week in those final verses of that book. 2007, I think I've shared this story uh, with some of you. I'm not sure I've shared it from this platform. But in 2007, I was invited to go along with five other pastors from around the country to Beijing, China, on an exploratory trip. Uh, we went and, or I went and met with <clears throat> the missionaries on the field there in, in, in exploring the city. Uh, he, they sent us out on all kinds of projects. The goal was that we would go and do some exploratory work for these missionaries and come back to the United States and build a team and go back the following year, 2008, for the Olympics. And we were going to work and do projects with them there. So in 2007, <clears throat> uh, I, my sleep schedule was upside down when I got there. And so I went out early in the morning walking, made my way down. And I saw a park across the street. So I went and started walking through the park. And I hear behind these bushes, these trees, ping pong going on. Now I played uh, soccer in college and the majority of the players uh, on the soccer team were from Jamaica in that part of the world and, and Africa, and ping pong was their thing. So I kind of got sucked into that environment. And so ping pong, I thought I was okay. So I went back there, and, and I just sat down on a bench because all these cement ping pong tables were occupied by elderly people, and they're playing. And so I sat down, and I noticed that everyone looks over and sees the white guy sitting over there on the bench. So eventually, this older lady, she comes over and says, she didn't, well, she said something, but I didn't understand it. But I could tell she was saying, do you want to play? So I go, and, and I get on the table, and I hold my own, and I do okay. Everyone else is watching. I come back the next day. I'm invited to play again on the table, and all of a sudden I notice people lining up to play the white guy. (laughs) So it was a great way to uh, meet and encounter the beautiful people of China. On the third or fourth day, all of the tables were full, and this elderly woman that I had been playing against she wasn't there. She finally showed up. All the tables are full. And I notice in her bag, there are badminton rackets. And so I pointed to the rackets and she says, you? I said, well, yeah, I was a PE major in college. Of course I could play badminton. Uh, My my professor in college was the Olympic badminton coach for the United States. And so that was, I think I'm okay. So we walk down and there's a net tied between two trees. And right beside it is another net tied between two trees. So we start playing badminton. And I I don't even know her name. And on the court next to me was a younger gentleman who could tell we were trying to communicate. He came over and in very broken English began to interpret for us. I said, what is her name? And, And she gave a name and all I knew to call her was grandma from that point on. End of the week comes. And I give to her my business card that simply had my email address on it. That's all it had, my name and email address. I hand that to her. And I look over, and this young man is standing there, and his hand is out. I want one. So I give him one of my cards. By the time I get home, back to America, I have an email from this guy. And so we start going back and forth, and he He's telling me, you know, about himself, and he finally it comes out in one of the emails. My wife is an eighth grade English teacher here in China. I said, no way. My wife is an eighth grade English teacher here in America. And so I connect Catherine with his wife. They start emailing back and forth, and a friendship is built. 
We start emailing over that year, and as it gets closer, I said, listen, we're coming back in August for the Olympics. When you get here, let us know. We want to take you out to dinner. Okay. So starts getting closer. Now, let me give you some backstory. When we first came into ministry, we moved to Sterling, Colorado, and in that ministry was a young man named Sean Kramer, who I had the opportunity to introduce him to Jesus. He placed his faith in Jesus to be his Lord and Savior. He and a girl that was in the ministry, Shana, eventually went to college, got married, and got involved in Campus Crusades for Christ. We, it's now called Crew. So they jump in full speed ahead with Crew, and they go on a mission to guess where? Beijing, China. So when Catherine and I and our team that we put together fly back to Beijing, Sean and Shana are in Beijing. I told Sean and Shana, this couple has invited us to go out to dinner. Why don't you join us? Kind of as an interpreter type situation. So they come. We go out to dinner. We sit down at a, at a restaurant, and it was at this moment that I had a crisis in my walk with the Lord. We sat down at this table and this young man from China, from Beijing, he orders us dinner, he orders all the food and then it happened. The waiter comes to the table and he places a beer in front of every single one of us at the table. I looked over at Sean and I said, I ain't drinking that. And this young man, 22, 23 years old, I'd been his football coach in Sterling, his youth pastor, his mentor. He looked right back at me, and with as serious as he could be, he looked back at me and he says, you will drink that. Don't you forget why you are here. Joel, for you not to drink that, or at least part of it, would be a huge insult to them. Don't you forget why you are here. And I had a crisis. Guys, I'm telling you, I grew up in a Southern Baptist pastor, Southern culture environment where, <laughs> I mean, Anna, I think you can vouch for me. That Anna's my sister, by the way. Uh, that ain't going to happen. You don't do that. Drinking, uh, smoking, dancing, gambling. I mean, these are all, you're about to step off the edge into hell. And I had a crisis moment in my life. I tell you that story. Because what Paul is dealing with in Romans chapter 14 is very similar. He's dealing with things that there's something has come up. Just when you and I thought that things were going okay, everything's good in the church in Rome, first century, he starts addressing to that church, those people, a couple of issues that were causing division in the church. And so he deals with it. He addresses it. And as we continue to look at these passages following Romans 12, 1 and 2, you remember chapters 1 through 11, he's teaching us those doctrinal foundational issues of the gospel. Chapter 12 through the end of the book is coaching. Here's how you apply it. Here's how you take what I've been teaching you and you apply it to your life. Hey, man, I, I, I appeal to you. Offer your body as a living sacrifice unto the Lord holy and acceptable and pleasing to him. Hey man, don't be, don't be conformed by the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And he goes on and love your enemy and, and be respectful, respect and honor those people in government and give to the government what's theirs. But you give this debt that you'll never have a zero balance to everyone else, this debt of love. Love people. And then he gets to 14, chapter 14, and he deals with couple of issues that you and I don't have to deal with, or I say I, we don't have to deal with. You'll understand when we read it. But he's talking about what food you can or can't eat. 
and what some people, how they deal with certain days of the week. I don't think that's a big issue for us. I mean, as you can tell, I, I eat about anything. But there are certainly issues that happen in churches today that we'll call disputable matters, as he mentions. Opinions that in some churches, I haven't seen it here. I'm not saying that it's not present. I don't know every conversation and every relationship that caused division. And today is a, is a coaching point to make sure you don't take those disputable matters, things that we can have differing opinions on, and cause division in the church. In David Platt's book, oh, let me read, let me read our text to us real quick. Romans chapter 14. I want to read verses 1 through 12. If you'll stand with me in the honor of reading God's word, I would appreciate that if you're able. Chapter 14. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him. But do not quarrel over opinions or disputable matters. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. None of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For, for if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For, for to this end, Christ died and lived again that he might be both Lord, be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or, or why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Father, we ask that you would take your word, reach deep into our hearts, speak truth to these things that he is calling opinions or disputable matters and help us to be people of grace. I pray this in your holy name, amen. Romans 14 and the first half of 15 deal with this issue of unity in the church, being unified. Paul's going to teach us that uh, living in unity is critical even when we disagree on things with, with great passion. Some of these issues we are very passionate about. But they're not essential to the gospel message. There are things, uh, there are going to be things that people disagree about, but they should not lead to a vision. In, in David Platt's book, uh, Don't Hold Back, he mentions early on in his book three buckets, and I've, I didn't have buckets, and I didn't think they'd fit on this stand, so I used glasses. Three buckets that people put items in. In bucket number one, foundational doctrinal issues, verses one through 11, I mean chapters one through 11, the gospel message. What are our foundational issues? Jesus was born of a virgin. Jesus lived a sinless life. Jesus died on the cross for the atonement of sin for all people. 
Jesus was dead as a hammer and was buried and was there for three days. On the third day, Jesus rose, conquering and defeating the power of sin and death and has ascended to heaven and is alive today. And one of these days, he's going to come back and get his church. I mean, so we're talking foundational doctrinal issues. Bucket number one. Bucket number two. These are beliefs and practices that unite followers of Jesus, but not essential to salvation. This bucket includes uh, things that we might disagree upon from church to church. That church down the street, they believe in those doctrinal issues that, that we just mentioned. But they practice and do different things or things differently than we might do at this church. Good, solid brothers and sisters in Christ but they practice their faith a little different. Some churches might say, well, we baptize our infants. At this church, we say we baptize who? Believers. Believers' baptism is what we practice here. Brothers and sisters, the, the foundational issues were solid, but they practice, and uh, us from church to church might practice things a little different. One church might believe that King James is the only Bible that needs to be read. It is the authorized version. Well, that's not where we're at here. Good, solid brothers and sisters in Christ, but they practice. Does this make sense? Bucket number two items. Well, a different church, from church to church might differ a little bit. That's where we get different denominations and so forth, but good, solid brothers and sisters in Christ. Bucket three is what Paul is addressing today. Disputable matters. Bucket three. We might all agree on the issue of baptism, spiritual gifts, leadership in the church. But they might disagree on how the end times will unfold. Disputable matters. You have your opinion. I, I, I mean, I, I told you, when I taught through the book of Revelation, it was one of my reservations because there's so many different opinions about how the end times will unfold. Disputable matters. They might disagree on political issues. Might be Republicans, might be Democrats, might be independents. Bucket three items. And that's what Paul is addressing here, whether you can eat this food or not eat this food. Whether you hold this day as special or all days are equal. Bucket three items. And I want to make sure what you walk away with today is what Paul is teaching is that churches get in trouble when we take bucket three items and we place them in bucket one. As if this is what will separate us as believers in the same way that bucket, bucket number one items separate believers from non-believers. We need to be careful that we're not doing this. And what I had done in Beijing, China, is I had done this. Does that make sense? I looked at Sean and said, I ain't drinking that, as if it belonged in here. And he said, you will. <laughs> this, you know, hey, when he said it to me, I was like, boy, you better recognize who you're talking to. <laughs> but what a lesson for me, huh? I mean, one of those moments of, I, I've put the wrong emphasis on the... Something syllable, I did that, totally messed that up. Let's keep the original reader in mind as we, as we think on this text. Many of the Roman Christians came out of pagan religions. When these pagan religions, they would offer sacrifices to their pagan gods. And then they, after they've made the sacrifice, they would take that meat 
and they would take it to the market and sell it. And there were Christians in this Roman church that came out of these pagan religions, and even some of the Jewish now followers of Jesus said, you can't eat that. That was offered, that's unclean, that is defiled meat, you can't eat it. A bucket three issue, according to Paul. I mean, you, Paul certainly had an opinion here. I mean, you see it in verse two uh, of, of where he was. Uh, the one person believes he may eat anything while the weak person, throws that word in there, only eats vegetables. Disputable matters. We need to be careful as we go along in our walk with the Lord, in, in our walk as a church body, that in this section of Romans, unity is a big deal. Being unified as a church. And when it comes to the bucket one issues, we will be unified. Today after our service in my office, we're having our new members class. We're going to talk about unity on the essentials. But when it comes to disputable matters, we're going to have liberty. As we are taught here in this passage. As he works through these topics, I've already mentioned one of the groups that he splits people into. The weak and the strong. Who, are we, who was he referring to when he talked about weak? He's not, I'm not crazy about those terms, but that's what's there. When he's talking about weak people, he's talking about those that are easily rattled. That their faith is easily rattled. Strong, on the other, other hand, are, are those that need to be patient with those that are easily rattled. The weak and the strong. We are to welcome those who have a differing opinion than we do when it comes to bucket three issues. The thing that saddens me today is that we live in a time in a society that it, this, this philosophy is growing that if you don't agree with me, if you have a differing opinion from me on you name the topic, we can't be friends anymore. Unfriend you on Facebook. Has that ever happened to anybody? Because you think or believe differently from someone else? And that saddens my heart. Paul is saying, in the church family, when it comes to bucket one, we're going to be unified. But when it comes to these disputable issues, we're going to show liberty and grace. And those that are strong are going to be patient with those that have a differing view. It's a good thing for you and I to have strong opinions. Look with me at verse 5. One person esteems one day better than the other, another esteems all days alike. Here it is. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Having a strong opinion on something is okay. But how we handle people and how we treat one another is what is being addressed here. James chapter 1, he told the, the Bible says that we're to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. I mean, the, how we handle one another is important. We need to make sure that we aren't taking bucket three items and treating them like they're a bucket one item. David Platt, if I could quote him from his book, he says this. And he's speaking of his church family there in Washington, D.C. Our church family is not fundamentally African-American, Asian-American, European-American, Hispanic-American, Native American, or even American. Our family is not fundamentally rich or poor. Our family is not fundamentally Republican, Democrat, or Independent. None of these things are grounds for division among us because our family is fundamentally Christian. We are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a people possessed by God himself. In the biblical gospel, we have been acquitted of sin before God the judge and adopted as daughters and sons by God the Father. And if we will realize and constantly remember this, we will experience so much needed healing, not just in the church, 
but in our lives. These three buckets I thought was a great picture for us as we work through this passage. I want to read the second half of of this chapter uh, and, and allow you to just take in the word of God, but then I want to point out Uh, four guidelines that Paul presents to us. So I'm going to read the second half of the chapter, starting in verse 13. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then... Let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Let me say that one again. Joel, do not, for the sake of that beer that was set down in front of you, destroy the work of God. Does that make sense? Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubt in his is condemned if he eats because he is eating not in faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. This passage, all the way through through verse 13 of chapter 15, is dealing with unity in the body. Unity in the body. Let me work quickly through four guidelines that that, uh, Paul points out to us. Uh, I would encourage you to go and on Right Now Media, J.D. Greer is doing a great study through the book of Romans, and, and I've uh, grabbed some of his points in that text to help us digest the word this week. First guideline that he points out is to follow your heart. Look at verses 4, I'm sorry, 5 and 6 in verse 14. One person esteems one day better. I just read that. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord. Whatever it is that you and I are thinking about when it comes to this bucket number three, can you and I look at ourselves fully convinced? I would be glad to do this if Jesus were sitting at the table with me. I'm fully convinced in honor of the Lord, he says. So follow your heart. Follow your conscience. Be fully convinced on what you're doing is a pattern of living that would be honoring to the Lord. I'd be glad to do it if he was standing right here with me. Second guideline. Be patient with those who don't believe like you. Verses three and four. Let no one who eats despise the one who abstains. Let no one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed them. Just because someone doesn't eat what you eat doesn't mean they're a legalist. I'm not eating... I'm not going to eat that. That doesn't mean they're a legalist. And just because somebody does eat stuff you don't eat 
doesn't mean they're not sincere about holiness in their lives. Paul says, man, be patient. Stop passing judgment. They'll stand before God. And when we live by the principle, I'd be glad to do this, even if Jesus were sitting at the table with me, I, I'm fully convinced that this, what I'm, this behavior in my life, whatever it might be, is honoring to the Lord. An important principle for us to remember. Paul's like, man, don't be that guy. Don't be that guy that's always forming a critical opinion of other people because they don't think or believe like you believe on these issues. Don't be that guy. Don't be that girl. Be patient. Third principle is prioritize their spiritual health over your freedom. Over your freedom. Verse 15, for if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. And we owe a debt of love to them, don't we? By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. You and I, to show patience, to show deference to those who have a differing opinion on these issues, puts your maturity in Christ on full display. Full display. We're to prioritize others' spiritual health over their freedom. For example, if my being a Bronco fan I, 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 stay with me. I know this is a silly example, but I, I, it makes a point. If my being a Bronco fan were to cause somebody to stumble in their faith in Jesus Christ, not as an NFL fan, but in their faith in Jesus because he's a Bronco fan, I would gladly give up being a Bronco fan. I'm not going to mention the Las Vegas Raiders. Because we got serious. No, we don't. But guys, can I get personal for a second? Can I get real for just a second? I'm not going to stay here long because I don't want people getting up and walking out. If you discovered somebody in this room, somebody in this church body, voted for a different political party that you voted for, would that impact your friendship with them? If somebody in this church body voted and approved and was in favor of this presidential candidate versus that presidential candidate, one that you didn't vote for, would that impact your friendship with them? Would you unfriend them on Facebook? You see where I'm going. I made light with the Broncos thing, but this other one, guys, we see it. And I want to make sure that we understand that that issue that I just brought up, that political issue, is in that bucket. Are we okay? Church at Community of Grace, who you vote for will not be an essential. It's just not going to be who we are. Like I mentioned earlier, it saddens my heart that we've come to a place in our society that we seem to be no longer able to sit down and discuss views, discuss issues. Rather, we have simply said, you and I can't be friends. I ain't talking to you anymore. And that belongs here. Okay, I'll move on. Guys, I want you to talk about this in the car on the way home today. Do I, have, do I have disputable matters that I have taken and I've moved from there to there? Do I have things that I've made as important as doctrinal foundational issues and I've allowed that to hamper or hurt friendships and relationships? I want you to talk about it. It's a real thing. What are some freedoms that I have in Christ that could be hampering 
the cause of Christ. Talk about it. J.D. Greer, he went on and said this, if Christ loved him enough to die for him, I should be willing to refrain from doing the things that harm him or her. I'll move on. The fourth guideline that he points out in our text is to choose unity over uniformity. Choose unity over uniformity. The main point of our Christian walk is to love God and love others. We owe a debt that'll never have a zero balance. Again, I want to point out that Paul is not talking about these issues. He's not saying get soft on scripture. He's not saying water things down so that you can fit in with culture. No, Paul clearly said, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. I want to finish by reading a few verses out of chapter 15. on this issue of unity. I'm gonna read verses five through seven, and then I'm gonna finish with verse 13 if you want to follow along. Chapter 15, verse five. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen. Father, we thank you for this lesson. We thank you for your word that is so practical, so applicable, not only to the first century reader, but today and forevermore. We're thankful that your word is alive and it is active, and when we sit down and when we read it and we encounter your ancient holy words, we are encountering and interacting with the living God. So Lord, I pray that today we would be quick to listen to your word, slow to speak, that we would be quick to make those adjustments, that we would be quick to allow you to transform us by renewing our mind. And so, Lord, I lift up the person today that you may have laid on their heart things that are hampering your work that may be causing a brother to stumble and that they would make those course corrections. Lord, will you point those out? We give you here just a few moments to have the last word to speak into our hearts. And Lord, we will listen and we will respond.